Um, you maybe, maybe you see why I don't, <laughs> didn't raise my hand here. <laughs> but maybe if you look at the background, um, for some reason I'm still doing stuff that in some cases turns out to look quite pleasant to the eye, even though I'm totally in no way an artist. So um, how and why? Well, maybe let me introduce myself a little more. As a kid, of course, everybody has to go to school. I did so too. And in art, I probably sucked the most of everybody in the entire art class. I got the worst grades, so I always knew I'm not an artist. I, was a lot of, I had a lot of interest in the scientific things like chemistry or physics, but no way anything like an artist. But later on in my life, I started to become interested in movie making on the SEMA professional or amateur level. I helped out a lot of people in my area with their movies and did compositing and stuff. But um, yeah, I never did any special effects because they looked so arty and cool and I thought, well, you will never be able to do this. And there's another thread of the story. I became also interested in open source gaming. And I thought, well, I'm doing a little bit of coding, maybe I can help out. But it turned out that there is a little discrepancy in the developers of open source games. I mean, there, there's like all coders and no artists. And um, during those days, it was like um, there were more game engines than actual games made. Because everybody was coding, 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 and nobody was creating the required assets. And I thought, maybe I can help out on the asset side and try to do texturing, modeling, but I completely failed. In the end, I ended up making sounds. So time passed. A few years later, the two threads would connect. We had a class in university, and we were to required to make a game in teams of two. And I asked my colleague, well, why don't we try to create a complete game? Let's not rip the assets, let's create them ourselves. But he didn't want to create the assets. So I thought, well, maybe I will try one last time. <laughs> and um, I did a little research on the internet and discovered something really cool. It was a plugin for my compositing software that mainly looked like the left side of the screen. It was all just you entered values, and out came all this cool stuff on the right. So um, yeah, literally, uh, you just here you enter the values. Or maybe you turn some sliders, add a few colors, and you can do all this stuff on the right. And even more, I mean, even the background <laughs> I had done in the in this application. And this is just a few asset I, assets I could recover. I made a lot more. I made asteroids, explosions, uh, nebula for the background, a complete star shooter game, except for the ships. We ripped them eventually. <laughs> And, um, and I thought, wow, how, how, how can I do this? I mean, I, s I failed so much at anything that's any, anything like art, and now I am able to create such cool stuff. And I discovered that this approach to creating assets with just turning knobs and entering values, turning sliders, is very much like engineering or science. And so I thought, hey, I could tell all those nerds creating open source games how to do it properly and create cool looking stuff for their games. I created a tutorial website, but it got hacked before I actually released it. And um, I lost uh, track on top of that uh, university stuff and stuff. But I took the techniques that I learned here into visual effects. And for some reason, once I started to do visual effects, People in my area didn't just ask me, hey, can you cut this? Can you do the compositing stuff? They asked me for the effects, and it was the first time I was able to charge money for my work. <laughs> because people were very interested in this shiny stuff you see here. I mean, it's glowing, it's shiny, people like it. So I thought, well, I'll keep this. And at some point, I discovered Blender, and I guess you know the rest of the story. But there was something I also discovered when I got into Blender and visual effects, and that was that my big big discovery about those programs and you're just turning knobs and you're doing science instead of art and creating cool stuff, it's common in the visual effects industry. Actually, take a look at this um, excerpt from a job, or job offer at Pixar's. They're searching for a TD, that's a technical director, 
basically, he's the guy who's telling the 4FX guys what to do and runs around, solves problems, and directing the technical side of the visual effect things. And uh, the last line is the most important one. They want, if you uh, studied computer sciences, mathematics, physics, or engineering, you'll more probably get a job than somebody who didn't. And well, so my big discovery uh, wasn't that much a big discovery. It was a common thing. And uh, <laughs> so now I'm standing here and tell you that it's a common thing. And I didn't discover anything big. And there's even a school in Germany where you can learn how to be a TD. But to enter it, you have to have a such a degree, like in the last line. And so, what those studios want from a TD is a certain way to tackle problems. And basically, that's what you learn at university. When you're studying computer sciences, you don't so much learn um, algorithms or stuff. You learn how to think like a computer scientist, how to tackle those problems in a specific way, how to look at problems. And of course, today, there are theories for everything. I guess there will be <laughs> even theories on um, how to build a perfect um, convention and stuff, how to organize things. There's everything you can get a theory for. And so I discovered theories for um, scientific process, for how a scientist or engineer thinks, and how this works. And I'll just present you my favorite one. It's called diagrammatic reasoning. And if you're reading those two disclaimers I've put down, let me put a, a third disclaimer. I was asked whether I'm presenting any cool demonstrations of simulations here. No way. That's on Sunday. Today, I'm only presenting you the theory. And theorists are people living in disguise in ivory towers. It's not down to earth. It's um, very abstract. But if you want to stay here, ah, cool. I guess <laughs> people are staying here. Why not solve a small puzzle or riddle and get the theory from the practice? Because that's what theorists do. They look at stuff, and they, people are doing stuff, and they look from the top and think, how are they doing this? And then they're describing what they're doing. So who knows the answer already? Who knows the answer to this riddle? OK, please keep it to yourself. So we got a square here. And yeah, it's got a side and an area. And we want the area to double. Let's say, and we know from school that you just have to take this side, multiply it with the length of this side, and you know how big the area is. But let's see if we can solve this visually. Here, we got our side. What will happen if we double it? Oh, obviously, that didn't work out. Now we got four times the area, but we only want it to be doubled. So who's seeing the answer now? OK, a few more pe people. OK, now um, if you turn your head sideways, try it. Can you see the answer? OK. Take a look at the. Um, Square. I mean, we have four times the area, but we will only want to have it two times. What if we cut one of the squares in half? Then we have here only half the area, and if we quadruple this, we have four times half the area, so we have doubled the area. Pretty cool solution. So now let's do everything again, but look at it, and uh, check the theory of whether we did everything right. So how does this so-called diagrammatic reasoning work? Well, it's very much, it, actually, it's pretty simple. Um, you need to construct a diagram, experiment, observe the results. That's what we did. We constructed the square, and we did a little experiment, and we observed this, see that we were wrong, and we did things again. It's an iterative pro process. And of course, we also would need to know what's a diagram. And we just need to keep, it, keep in mind, for this definition, it's a system of relations that follow a certain rule. And the important thing is the relations. Because you, there's no way for your brain to get an insight into anything, to have a good idea without you having some relations in your mind or before you. 
And of course, that's uh, pretty simple how this works. I guess everybody knows how your brain looks. It's got all these cells, and they're connected. And think of the cells as objects and the connections as relations. And then you see why you always need relations if you want to learn something or if you want to uh, get an idea when you got the problem beforehand. Without the relation, no way to solve it. And in this uh, case, the relation, of course, pretty easy. We got the side, the length of the side, and it's related to the area. Wow. So, but you still think, how can we get it inside this way? Well, we did this experiment, and the diagram, the structure we built, it um, structured our prior knowledge. We had this prior knowledge about the area and the side, and through the experiment, we got an idea of new, a new relation we might discover, and that was the diagonal line. And I asked you to turn your head because um, that's the most important thing in uh, everywhere when you're working like an engineer or when you're working in a scientific part when you want to solve a riddle, change your perspective or your focus. If you don't do this, you won't uh, be able to solve many problems. And actually, this process is sometimes called thinking outside the box. And that's something, uh, if you're reading chop boards, uh, you always have, you often have to you have the description and it reads some way you need to be able to think outside the box. And that's pra practically it. That's what we've seen here. Yeah, um, literally. So uh, you might ask yourself, what's so cool about this? And this is something I grabbed from a German course on learning theory, and they're describing it this way. The top one is normal learning, like vocabulary, and the bottom is learning by insight. And I guess you get the difference. Learn vocabulary, you have to learn, you learn, 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 and somewhere, you know, sometime you have all the vocabulary you need. When you get an idea or an insight, you're having a moment, you didn't know the answer for the riddle, and from one moment to the other, you know it. So you're learning this way, and I think that's a lot cooler, at least to me it was cooler in the school, and that's probably why I was more interested in physics than in languages. And okay, I've seen some guys uh, pointing up to this. It's an error, but I kept it to show you that this is um, from a real book and not um, something I made up. Okay, and also, if you forget, when learning vocabulary, you'll forget, keep forgetting them, forgetting them, forgetting them, and stuff you know by insight, by ideas, you will keep the idea. Even a month after that, you will still have the idea in the back of your head, and you're, if you encounter the same situation, you will be able to solve the problem once again. So, that's of course is pretty cool, but there's something about it that's way cooler, and that's something that's uh, fascinating the researchers, and that's the thing that it's working on a subconscious level. Once you're deep enough into, in your problem, it won't go away. Even if you uh, become angry and you get away from the computer, don't know, solve something else, make yourself a good meal, or go to sleep, it might occur to you that your brain keeps working. You don't know it, but it keeps working. And then, in the morning, you wake up and you get the answer. Or imagine the following situation. Guy sits in the park, reads a book, he turns the page and stops in the middle. Then he closes the book very fast, puts it away, goes out of the park very fast, and you follow him home. And you see him opening up Blender, and he starts working on a recent simulation he did. And he's very hectic and everything. I guess you've seen me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's something really happening. And uh, if, when I got the idea, I usually have to stop everything I'm doing else and have to go to Blender and try it out <laughs> whether the idea is any good. So yeah, that's basically it, how the theory is working. But um, the answer, the question is, can we apply this to Blender? I say yes. Because in Blender, the simulation, you have a system of relations, and you've got um, a display of the outcome. So each of these um, buttons is relating, to the, has a relation to the outcome, and it's consistent. So if you do a simulation, run it, save the file, give it to someone else, he opens it, it should 
be exactly the same simulation on his computer. And I, uh, now let's go to the, say, meaty stuff, because I've told you so much, and uh, I guess you wanted to know, want to know how this relates to Blender and what you can implicate, whether there are, impl whether there are any implications for, for your workflow. Well, remember the second disclaimer, it's in a pre-scientific state, state, so it practically means you have to derive your own hypotheses and your own theories and your own implications, but there's a little bit it can already help you. First thing, I, sometimes I get approached by people who ask me, so um, we got this project and we're at the very end of it and we want to do now the simulations, but we got randomly this and this problem, can you solve it? Of course I can help them, but I, they, they got it wrong in your workflow. They should start as early as possible with all the simulation workflow, work stuff, and if they're running into big problems, they could Maybe do something else for a while, maybe a day or so, and then return to it. So the work, the time is not lost because you can do other stuff, but you might be a lot, uh, it might be a lot easier for you to tackle the problems yourself without needing to consult outer help. And of course, if you're a simulator, I guess everybody who's doing a lot of simulations has discovered his own mental toolbox of techniques how to analyze the simulation. Um, I've also got a few for myself, and uh, on Sunday, I might present one or two of those. And the learners, hmm, uh, it's a little more difficult, because I guess it's, uh, <laughs> you already know this, um, don't just redo the tutorials, do them yourself, and um, go further and explore, because that's the part where you have the diagrammatic reasoning kick in. It's not about um, doing something step by step, that's the normal kind of learning, but once you've done it, you need to go further and play. And also, something that's um, for me, I'm often doing this, is um, I'm searching for tutorials that cover a topic from different perspectives, like five ways to create a spider web. That's the cool tutorials, I think. And maybe, are there any teachers here? Okay. Um, do you could, of course, um, use diagrams. There's some research that um, diagrams are way more effective in teaching than, for example, text. But, uh, of course, it's really problematic because how to create a good one. And it could also happen that you're creating a diagram and the learner gets, hmm, what? And then he doesn't learn anything. But another idea is, of course, the multi-perspective tutorials. We already had that. Um, I'm trying to do this on Blender Diploma a little by creating series of tutorials that cover the same topic every year from a little bit of different outcome. And the last uh, one is actually tried and true. That's one where they actually did research, and if you place um, explaining elements directly inside your picture instead of beyond the picture, your learners will uh, remember things a lot easier and it will really help them to get an insight. I guess it was around 10% um, higher chance of getting it if you're putting the text directly into the, into the place where it belongs in the image and not above, beyond it. That's something I'm also trying to do at Blender Diploma, but I think um, that's not perfect yet. Um, I, I think you can do a lot better. And of course, is there any interface designer here or any Blender developer? Hey, <laughs> what do you think about this? That's how Houdini is, uh, giving you possibilities to analyze simulations. They're giving you a new perspective onto the simulations, and it's also very cool because it's a diagram inside the diagram. I think that we want, I, I, I want this in Blender. <laughs> Can we get it? <laughs> okay, thank you. So, any questions? Yeah, that's also very good. I also think that the node workflow is also very much like uh, the mind works and like diagrammatic reasoning works. So I'd, I'm really hoping for a node workflow in particles, in simulations, of course, in materials. We're getting this in cycles. I'm really looking forward to this kind of development. Uh, are we getting it? 
<laughs> You're doing old stuff. Maybe I should ask Lucas, right? Lucas is doing all the note work. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cool. Thanks. So I guess to. <laughs> See you on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs>